Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Tuesday, December 21st, we were working the night watch out of traffic division, hit and run felony detail. My partner's Frank Smith, the boss is Captain Calfee, Commander AID. My name's Friday. An elderly woman and her nine-year-old grandson had been struck down by a speeding truck. The woman was killed instantly. The hit and run driver escaped. We had to find him. I'd like to talk to you for a minute, if we could. Well, fine. Would you like to step inside? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. One of the officers in the traffic car, ma'am, told us you were one of the people who saw the accident. Yes, that's right. Terrible thing. It was an old lady and her grandson, you know. Yes, ma'am. There's a few questions we'd like to ask you. It won't take us very long here. Did anybody get the license number, do you know, officer? I, I mean, on that truck that ran them down? No, not that we know of. We understand the officers in the traffic car talked to you. You didn't see the number either, huh? No, I'm sorry I didn't. The whole thing happened so fast. It was all over before I knew what was going on. I saw the old lady and the little boy start to cross the street. Then, all of a sudden, this truck seemed to come right out of nowhere. Ran them down, kept right on going. Were the woman and the little boy crossing with the lights, did you notice? Well, yes, they did. They were crossing with the green light. I remember because they stood on the curb a minute and waited for the light to turn green. Terrible thing. That truck deliberately went through that red light. Didn't even slow down. Uh-huh. Did you happen to get a look at the driver, ma'am? Well, I could see it was a man driving the truck, but it went by so fast I just got a flash. Couldn't tell you what the man looked like, haven't any idea. About this truck that ran them down, do you think you'd know it if you ever saw it again? Well, I'm not sure. I, I think I might, yes. It was one of those delivery trucks, you know. I, I think you call it a panel truck. It was a light tan color all over, and there was black lettering on the side. Mm -hmm. Could you make out any of the lettering at all? Well, I think there were three or four words painted on the side, and I know one of them was bakery. I'm sure of that. Well, did you recognize what make a truck it was, ma'am, the year or the model? Well, it was a late model. I'm pretty sure of that. I think it was a Ford, one of those regular delivery trucks like some bakeries use. Anything else out of the ordinary you might have noticed about the truck, ma'am? Anything outstanding that might have caught your eye? Oh, I'm sorry, officer. That's about all I can tell you. How's the old lady? Do you know? And the little boy, could they tell anything? No, ma'am. The woman's dead. She was killed instantly. They've taken the youngster to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital for it. He's in pretty bad shape, too. How could anybody do such a thing? There just isn't any excuse for it. No excuse in the world. It was downright murder. Well, maybe that explains it. What? That's why he kept going. Eleven thirty-five p.m. Frank and I finished interviewing the cashier in the theater box office, and then we called the office and had them get out a supplementary broadcast and an APB on the description of the hit and run vehicle. We went back across the street to the scene of the accident where the officers in the T car, along with the crew from the crime lab, were finishing up their preliminary investigation. We interviewed two more witnesses to the hit and run accident, but they were unable to tell us anything that we didn't already know. When we got back to the office, we put in a call to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital where they told us that the nine-year-old boy struck down by the hit and run driver was still in critical condition. The husband of the 64-year-old woman who'd been killed instantly was brought downtown to the morgue where he identified the body. The next morning, we got out a special bulletin to all garages, auto repair, and paint shops throughout the city to be on the lookout for a late model tan panel truck, black lettering on the sides with damage to the front end. 8.30 a.m., Frank checked with communications. It was Doc Hall at Georgia Street. I asked him about the boy. The old lady's grandson? How's he doing? Pretty much the same. Condition critical, that's all I'll tell you. That's a lousy shame. Communications getting any kickback on that all points yet? No, nothing. Did you get in touch with the crime lab? Yeah, they're not going to be able to help much, though. What did they find out there? Anything at all? Oh, just what we saw. A few small pieces of glass, probably from one of the headlights of the truck. They don't think they're going to be able to do much with them, though. Not enough to go on. And that's the only physical evidence they got, huh? That's all. Might be able to tie it down a little tighter if we could find that panel. Did you start checking on that bakery truck angle yet? Yeah, McGowan and I call every bakery in town. Got it pretty well narrowed down. There are only two companies that use tan late model panels for delivery trucks. Yeah. Only one of them uses black lettering on the sides of the trucks. Other companies says they use red lettering. Which one has the black? Well, I got it right here. The Nielsen Wholesale Bakery. 
They got a fleet of 173 trucks all the same. Tan color, black lettering on both sides, late model Ford delivery trucks. Mm -hmm. They tell you whether or not any of their drivers could have been making deliveries at that time of night, 10, 30, 11 o'clock? Yeah, there are about a dozen of them out on deliveries. More of them to account for than that, though. How do you mean? Well, all their drivers are allowed to take the trucks home with them when they're off duty if they want to. I'm afraid it's going to mean checking out every one of them, Joe. Well, we might as well get moving on it. They're going to give us some kind of a list to work with? Yeah, got it all set up with them. I'll get it. Accident investigation, Smith. Oh, yeah, Don. He did, huh? Okay, thanks for calling. Yeah, da. It's a rotten deal. Why, what's the matter? The young kid, the grandson. Yeah. Just died. Many times and on many different occasions, the police officer has it proved to him that there can be very little difference between a crime of neglect and a crime that's been willfully premeditated. If you look at it closely enough, you can judge it for yourself. How much difference, for example, as far as moral guilt is concerned, is there between the following? Number one, a man who plans a killing, takes up a gun, finds his victim and shoots him to death. Or number two, the man who thinks he has to look out for no one's welfare but his own, gets behind the wheel of a car, disregards the ordinary rules of safety, and proceeds to commit homicide with a motor vehicle. Oftentimes, the crime masquerades under the guise of an accident. Morally, no matter how you spell it, it adds up to murder just as surely as if the person had taken a gun and shot his victim down. The way it looked to us, the hit-and-run killing of the elderly woman and her grandson was a prime example. Wednesday, December 22nd, Frank and I began checking out the delivery trucks owned by Nielsen's Wholesale Bakery. Late that afternoon, we located one of the trucks with recent damage to the front end. We checked and found the driver's name was Arthur V. Singer. We drove out to his home to interview him. No, I wasn't working last night, officer. I was off. What's it all about? Did you spend the night at home, Mr. Singer, or were you out? I was home part of the time. After dinner, I went downtown and did a little bowling. Our neighborhood team bowls every Tuesday night. Where's that, sir? The place downtown. It's on West 7th. We got a pretty good team. Mm -hmm. Did you drive down, Singer, or did you take the bus? No, I drove down. Had the company truck with me. They let us use them when we're off duty. We pay for the gas. Did you drive down by yourself, or was there someone else with you? No, I was alone. The other boys had their cars. When did you leave the bowling alley, you remember? Oh, about 10, 10, 15, I'd say. How'd you drive home, Singer? I mean, what route did you take? Well, drove straight out West 7, got to Coronado, came over Coronado to the house here. What do you want to know? What time did you get home? About a quarter to 11. Say, this wouldn't be about that little scrape I had last night, would it? What was that? Well, down at 7th and Grandview, right by MacArthur Park there. The old guy in the car ahead, he stopped fast right in front of me. Didn't even signal. That right? Yeah, almost plowed right into him. Lucky I was watching, slammed on the brakes, turned and tore the curb. Hey, you should have seen it. I clipped the headlight and the right fender off against the telephone pole. Had to take the truck in this morning, get it fixed up. There are any witnesses to this accident you had, Singer? Yeah, half a dozen people saw it. Did you get any names and addresses? Well, no, I didn't. I was so teed off about the whole thing, I guess I didn't think about it. Is there anyone at all we can check with? Anybody to corroborate your story? Just the old guy in that car. She was a lousy driver. I really chewed him out. You got his name and address? Well, no, but I took down his license number. I wasn't going to pay for the damages. He admitted it was his fault. I see. Do you mind giving us that license number? Well, no, if I can find it. I, I wrote it down on the back of an old envelope, and I thought I put it in my jacket. But when I looked this morning, it wasn't there. It's around someplace, though. I'll check around again before I leave for work. It's bound to turn up. I'd like to have you look for it right away, Singer. It's pretty important. Look, I don't think I get it off. So what's this all about, anyway? Preliminary investigation. You want to see if you can find that number for us? Well, why? What's it have to do with an investigation? I didn't do anything. That old man, it was his fault. A bakery truck was involved in a serious accident last night, same kind you were driving. Afraid you're going to need an alibi, Singer. An alibi? I don't know what you mean. Why do I have to have an alibi? Well, you just take my word for it. You need one. Well, why do I need one? Two reasons, mister. Yeah? A nine-year-old boy and his grandmother. continued questioning the suspect Arthur Singer, but he denied any knowledge of the hit-and-run accident the night before at the intersection of Drexel and Pico Boulevard. We stayed with him while he searched his home for the license number of the car, which he said caused him to have his accident the night before. After half an hour of looking, he came up with a number scribbled on a scrap of paper which he'd found under the scarf on the dresser. We put in a call to RDMV, and they came back with the information that the license number was registered to a Mr. Thomas Foley on Lancashire Boulevard. We drove to the address to check with Mr. Foley, but there was nobody home. We left our card along with a message to contact us as soon as possible. 4.15 p.m., Frank and I got back to the office. At 4.35, Mr. Foley returned our call. Oh, yes, sir, that's right. 
Mm-hmm. Oh, I see. What time was that? Do you remember? Uh-huh. All right, Mr. Foley, thanks very much. Yeah, we may be contacting you later. Right. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. Yeah? I thought this was starting out too easy. What'd he say? Apparently, this Arthur Singer's telling us the truth. Mr. Foley says he did have a little scrape with the bakery truck last night. He described Singer as the driver of the truck. Well, how about the location? Foley pretty sure about that, is he? Grandview and West 7th. Says it happened about 1035 last night. That puts Singer about three miles from the scene of the hit and run. It's impossible, Joe. If this Mr. Foley's right, Singer couldn't have done it. Wasn't anywhere near the accident. I thought sure he was it, didn't you? Well, we can drive out and double check it with Foley. I can't think of any reason why I should lie about it, can you? I get it. Accident investigation Friday. Oh, yeah, Ted. Where? Yeah. Nobody, huh? Yeah. You bet. Right away. Thank you. Well, it's moving fast. Good piece of luck. Who was it? Ted Zimmerman. He and McClendon are down at the south end of town. Yeah. The hit-and-run truck. They think they found it. 4.28 p.m. Frank and I left the office and drove to the south end of the city where we met with Sergeants Zimmerman and McClendon, a block from where the tan panel bakery truck had been located. As soon as the truck had been discovered, an immediate stakeout was placed on it. A code 5 was broadcast on the vehicle's location, warning all units to stay away so as not to discourage the suspect in case he decided it was safe to return and get the truck. Frank and I drove down the side street where the truck was parked and got a good look at the front end of it. The right headlight was damaged and so was the right fender. While Zimmerman and McClendon remained on stakeout, Frank and I contacted the Nielsen Bakery people again, gave them the number of the truck, and they traced down the driver's name for us. He was listed as Daniel Miller. He'd been employed by the bakery for the past three years, and he had a good record. 5.30 p.m. We checked at his home address, but his wife told us he wasn't there. She said that besides driving a truck for the bakery, he also had a part-time job at night. He worked as a counterman at a small coffee shop on Wilshire Boulevard. We drove out to the coffee shop and interviewed him on the job. No, I'm sorry. I don't know where the truck is. I wish I did. What happened, Miller? Was it stolen? No, no, not exactly. A fella comes in here quite a bit. His name's Paul. He's a good customer. He borrowed the truck from me last night. Said he'd only be gone an hour, and I haven't seen him since. Where does this man live, this friend of yours, Paul? Well, to tell the truth, I don't know. He's a good customer. He comes in quite a bit at night when I'm working. I've got to know him pretty well. He asked to borrow the truck for an hour. Didn't think much about it. I let him have it, and I haven't seen him since. Is anything wrong? What's his Paul's last name, do you know? No, I guess I don't. Never thought to ask, as a matter of fact. Guess I never had any reason to. About what time was it last night when you loaned him the truck? A little after 8 o'clock, I think it was. He said he wanted to take his television set to a guy he knew and get it fixed. He told me to be back at 10 o'clock at the latest. You don't know where this man lives? You have no idea how to get in touch with him? No, I guess I don't, Sergeant. Why? You in the habit of lending the truck to strangers? No, not usually. What's your beef anyway? What's it all about? What are your hours here at the coffee shop, Miller? When do you check in for work and when do you leave? I check in at 7 o'clock. I go straight five hours to midnight. That's when we close up at midnight. You worked that shift last night, did you? 7 p.m. straight through to midnight? That's right. Monday through Saturday, six days a week. That's the schedule. Just a part-time job for me, you know. Extra dough. My regular job driving the truck for the bakery. I see. Was anyone around last night when your friend Paul came in to borrow the truck? Another customer, waitress, somebody we could double-check with? Well, there were a couple of other customers in the place. I don't know who they were, though. Why do you have to double-check anyway? I haven't done anything. I loaned Paul the truck, that's all. Have you got any way at all of proving you were here from 7 to 12 last night? Well, there must have been some customers you waited on, you remember. Sure, at least half a dozen. They'll tell you I was here. We'd like to have their names and addresses, if you don't mind, Miller. Yeah. Excuse me a second. got to wait on the customer. Sure, go ahead. Hi, Danny. Missed you last night. Hi, Fred. What do you have? I want some coffee and a raisin pie. How's it going? Pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah, man, the missus dropped by after the show last night looking for you. That's so? Yeah. About 10.30. How are you, Dan? Wednesday, December 22nd. We continued questioning the hit-and-run suspect, Daniel Miller, for a full hour, but he seemed to be unable to account for his time the previous night. His first story was that he'd been on duty behind the counter in the coffee shop without a break between the hours of 7 p.m. and midnight. Then, after the customer entered and disclosed that he was in the coffee shop at 10.30 the night before and that Miller was nowhere about, the suspect switched his story. 
He said he thought that he had left the coffee shop briefly for about 15 minutes between 10.30 and 10.45 p.m. to run down the street to a hotel to say goodbye to some friends of his who were leaving for New York. We checked the hotel, but they didn't know Miller and they hadn't seen him the night before. They were sure of it. The questioning of the suspect continued, but he made little or no sense at all. Apparently, he was piling up lie after lie in an effort to cover his tracks before and after the hit-and-run murder the night before. 7.48 p.m., Frank and I pulled Miller off the job at the coffee shop and took him downtown to the office. I'm telling you, it's the truth. I wasn't in that truck last night. I wasn't in an accident. I don't know what you're talking about. And give us something to go on, Miller. You've handed us three different stories so far. Not one of them strong enough to hold water. I'm telling you the truth. What are you trying to hang this on me for? I didn't have a wreck and I didn't kill anybody. Why are you picking on me? Because you don't make sense, mister. You're trying to sell us a story and you haven't got an ounce of proof to back it up. That bakery truck you're responsible for is the same truck that killed that old woman and the little boy. Now, you either come up with a solid story we can check on or you're going to be resting your back in Maine jail. Listen, call Bill Jackson. He's a good customer. He was in last night, I think. He'll tell you. Go ahead and call him. He'll back up what I say. What's his number? Do you know? Yeah, I got it right here in my wallet. Bill will tell you. Here it is. Hollywood 08121. Okay, thanks. William Jackson there, please. Yes, ma'am, it's important. All right. Yes, yeah, so, well, all right, then. Will you have him call Michigan 5211? Yes, ma'am, that's right. That's extension 2885. Right, thank you. He's busy. He'll call back in a minute. He'll tell you the truth. I was in the coffee shop all night. Just those couple of minutes, I ran down to the hotel to say goodbye to those friends of mine. That's the only time I left the place. How come you didn't tell us that to begin with, Miller? You say you got nothing to hide. Why do you have to hand us three different stories? Which one are we supposed to believe? I got nervous, that's all. When you first came in and started to ask questions, I didn't know what it was all about. I didn't know there was any trouble. I just loaned the truck to this guy Paul as a favor. How'd I know what he was going to do, getting himself in a jam like that? Try and look at it from where we stand, Miller. You loan out your truck to a man. You don't know his last name. You don't know where he lives. You say he must have been driving that truck when the old lady and the boy were killed. Sure, he must have been driving it. I wasn't. I was back at the coffee shop. I was there to midnight. All right, then, you prove it to us. If you know the man well enough to loan him the truck, you ought to be able to find him. There you are. Must be Bill Jackson. He'll tell you. Go ahead. See what he says. Accident investigation, Friday. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Mr. Jackson, this is Sergeant Friday. Yes, sir. Uh-huh. I wonder if you tell me if you know a Daniel Miller. Miller, yeah. Well, when's the last time you saw him, would you remember? I see. Well, the place where he works, the coffee shop? Yeah, well, were you there last night by any chance? Did you see Miller in there? You're sure? Uh-huh, yes, sir, I see. No, no, thanks, no. That's all for now. We'll contact you later on. Yes, sir, thank you. Bye. He told you, didn't he? Is that enough for you? He says he hasn't been in the coffee shop for three days. Nine forty-five p.m. Our interrogation of the hit-and-run suspect Daniel Miller went on. At his suggestion, we called a half a dozen people who we figured might substantiate his alibi, but none of them were able to. Miller continued to deny any knowledge of the hit-and-run killing but he still couldn't account for his whereabouts at the exact hour that the nine-year-old boy and his grandmother were run down. The time element especially didn't work in his favor. Nothing worked in his favor. 11.30 p.m., Frank and I took Daniel Miller over to the main jail where he was booked in on suspicion of 480 V.C. The following afternoon, his lawyer obtained a writ and he was released from custody. The writ was returnable in five days. He came immediately to the office to plead with Frank and me to help him find Paul, the man who'd borrowed his truck and thus clear himself. We took him up on it. Either way, we figured we'd get to the bottom of it. If Miller dreamed up the character Paul to escape blame for the hit-and-run killing, we were bound to find out sooner or later. If Miller was telling the truth, and we had little reason to believe he was, and a man named Paul had borrowed the truck the night of the hit-and-run killing, we were bound to find that out, too. In any event, we had to investigate. It's the job of the police officer to prove guilt or innocence, not guilt alone. Two days passed, and then another two. The Monday following the Christmas weekend, we were ready to call a halt. 
Well, I don't know what else we can do. I think we've given him enough time, don't you? Well, the deeper we get into it, the more it looks like Miller's our man. I still can't make up my mind. Why do you have to be stubborn about it, Joe? We checked every possible angle on his story. We still haven't got an ounce of proof this guy Paul he talks about even exists. We can't string along with Miller forever. Yeah, I suppose you're right. We've given him a square enough break on it, haven't we? I still got that queer hunch, though. It's possible he might be telling us the truth. Look, we've gone four straight days on it. We haven't come across one lead to back up his story. Too much for me. I can't buy it. Sergeant? Oh, hi, Miller. How are you? Okay. Glad to see you. Well, we've been looking for your friend, Miller, and we still haven't found a trace of him. That's why I came down to see you. A friend of mine called me this morning. He knows this guy, Paul, I told you about. He said he saw him last night. Going to a hotel down on South Flower. How come we haven't heard from this friend of yours before? We checked through twice on the list of everybody you know. This fellow's been out of town. Just got back yesterday. When he heard about the jam I was in, he called me about seeing Paul. Mm-hmm. This hotel Paul was supposed to have been seen going into. You got the address, have you? Yeah. It's over on South Flower, right near 12th. You want to go over there with me right now? This friend of mine wouldn't kid me. Paul must be there. You're sure about that, are you? He must be. I'll bet a month's pay on him. You might be low, mister. What? It has to cost you a lot more than that. We went up to the third floor to room 318, but the man registered as Paul Barton wasn't in. He'd left no word at the desk as to when he'd return. We sent Miller home and told him to wait for our call. Frank and I went on stakeout at the hotel. At 7.25 that night, Paul Barton returned to his room and we began questioning him. He showed no signs of being upset. His answers were quick, straightforward, and they seemed to make sense. The interview went on, a half hour, an hour, and Barton began to grow nervous. He contradicted himself. Big holes began to show up in his story as to how and where he'd spent his time the night of the hit-and-run killing. Eight forty-five p.m., Frank and I took Barton back to the office. We'd called Miller at his home. He was asked to come downtown as soon as possible. Meantime, we checked Paul Barton through R&I, and the questioning went on. You're a little mixed up about that, aren't you, Mr. Barton? I thought you said you went to that bar downtown about 10 p.m., and then you went to visit at your sister's house. Now you tell us you went to your sister's house first, then you went to the bar downtown. Now, which is it? That's getting a little high-handed, isn't it? What do I have to account for my time to you? If it wasn't important, we wouldn't be asking you. I think you know that. I don't know anything of the kind. You're trying to take advantage of me. That's the only impression I get. I think I've answered enough of your questions. I'm going back to the hotel. Just a minute, Barton. One more thing. Yeah? The last time you were arrested for a traffic violation, you want to tell us what the charge was? What? I think you heard me. Well, that was a year ago. I was driving a little too fast going on Beverly Boulevard. What's that got to do with it? Our record bureau says the charge was drunk driving. Your license was revoked. Well, so what? I haven't been driving. I haven't been near a car. What about last Tuesday night? Huh? Last Tuesday night. You do any driving then? No, of course not. Sure about that, are you? You're not trapping me. I've answered all your questions. I'm getting out of here. Just stay put, mister. You're not going anyplace. All right, Frank, you want to check outside, see if they brought Miller in you? Yeah, sure. Thanks. You can't keep me here. It's illegal. You got nothing to hold me on. Well, then you got nothing to worry about, have you? We got a guy by the name of Miller coming in. He says he thinks he knows you. Miller? I don't know any Miller. Nice going, Paul. Where you been? I said, where you been? What'd you do with the truck? Why, you two bastards. Sit down. I didn't do it. I didn't do a thing. You can't prove it. You can't prove I did. They're gonna prove it, Paul. I'm gonna help them prove it. You sure have been a real good friend. I'll give me a break, Danny. I didn't mean it. Honest, I didn't mean it. I loan you the truck. You get boozed up. You run down the little kid and the grandmother. Then you take off, leaving me holding the sack like I did it. I didn't mean it, Dan. It was an accident. I wasn't boozed up. Yeah, you're a real good friend. I hope you get it in the neck. I hope you get it with both barrels. It's not true, Sergeant. I wasn't boozed up. I only had two drinks. Believe me, that's all I had. Yeah. Well, I couldn't have been drunk. It doesn't affect me that way. Two drinks never hurt me. They never hurt me. I can prove it. Don't prove it to me. What? That little boy and his grandmother. They buried him this morning. You go ahead and prove it to them, mister. February 28th, trial was held in Department 87, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspect was tried and convicted of violation of the State Vehicle Code, Section 480, a hit-and-run felony. 
which is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for not less than one nor more than five years. Thank <laughs> you.